Welcome. Welcome to the 10th in the series of distinguished speakers here at CREATE. Welcome to the University of Southern California campus. Uh, we are in our 10th, or approaching our 10th year of operation at CREATE. We are sponsored jointly by the Science and Technology Division of the uh, De Department of Homeland Security, by the Viterbi School of Engineering, and by the Price School of Public Policy. I bring greetings from our deans, Janis Jortzos of Engineering, and Jack Knott of the Price School of Public Policy. I want to welcome you. I want to give a special welcome to our executive program students. Uh, they are in their uh, third day, actually. We start on Sunday, and they'll be here through Friday afternoon. I also want to uh, give a special welcome to Randy Hall, our Vice Provost for Research, who's one of the founding fathers of CREATE. Randy and Detloff von Witterfeld, who many of you know, established CREATE in 2003 and 2004. I'd like to uh, call up Mr. Errol Southers, soon to be Dr. Errol Southers, who has been the inspiration behind this speaker series, and uh, he's one of the most well-known men on our campus and has been able to attract really top quality speakers in. Errol, please come up and introduce our speaker. Thank you, Steve. And good afternoon. And so on behalf of, of CREATE and the university, I want to welcome you and thank you for coming this afternoon. Uh, I would always be remiss, and I always start this way by saying, first, I want to thank uh, our men and women in uniform that are serving both here and abroad, keep us safe so we can have events like this, and I'd like to give them a round of applause. And of course, all of our first responders, emergency responders who are here today and, and working throughout the city and the country. Um, I have the honor, if you will, of, of being associated now with CREATE for seven years. We are in the fifth um, rendition of our executive program in counterterrorism, as Steve mentioned, which is a week-long program. We have executives typically from state, local, federal law enforcement, first responders, local government, private sector, and uh, often around the world who attend this session. And it mirrors a session that our colleague who opens this uh, program, Boaz Ganur, Dr. Ganur, is the director of the International Institute for Counterterrorism in Herzliya, Israel, and he holds his executive program in January and always comes here every summer to open hours. So he was here on Sunday and everything started uh, very well. So we are going to look at, I believe, a video. Okay, so I'll indulge you here for a moment. Established in 2004, and funded by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, CREATE is an interdisciplinary research center based at the University of Southern California. Focusing on risk and economic analysis, the center comprises a team of experts across the country with the mission to leverage academic research for real-world solutions to homeland security issues. One of these projects is Armour. Armour originated in 2007 with the LAX police coming to us with the challenge of the fact that they had limited security resources and they had to be deployed at LAX intelligently. And this is the question that is at the heart of armor. How do we take our limited security resources and deploy them in an intelligent fashion? Limited security resources prevent full security coverage at all times. Computer-assisted randomization of security operations can help remove repeated patterns that may be exploited by intelligent adversaries. To do this, Armour modernizes a 70-year-old theory known as game theory. Game theory is a mathematical approach to solving problems that arise when we have two adversaries and each one wishes to maximize their gain at the expense of the other. We formulate these as mathematical games because then we can use the power of computers and mathematics to solve for optimal solutions. A game consists of a set of players, a set of actions available to those players. 
and a specification of payoffs for each combination of strategies. We see this every day in real life. For instance, when you go to a football game, you're going to see two people playing against each other in a game. And their optimal strategies are called mixed strategies. A mixed strategy is a randomization of the possible things you can do. By randomizing and being unpredictable, we're able to gain an advantage over our adversary. And this is what the ARMOR technology is all about. ARMOR stands for Assistant for Randomized Monitoring Over Routes. The algorithm at the heart of the ARMOR technology was designed and developed at CREATE and the University of Southern California by a team of engineers and researchers. And by solving this game, what we get is an optimal allocation of our limited security resources. Specifically, where should the checkpoints be set up and when, in the case of LAX, or when and where should the K9 units be deployed, giving them a patrolling pattern which is randomized. The most recent application, Armor Trusts, or Tactical Randomization for Urban Security in Transit Systems, is currently being tested and evaluated by the LA Sheriff's Department. So we were approached by the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department for randomizing patrols on trains for counterterrorism, for suppressing crime, and for catching ticketless travelers on trains. We learned about the Armor Project, which was initially deployed at the airport, and we saw that uh, the Armor Project would likely have uh, utility applied to uh, the, the transit system, both bus and rail. The Los Angeles Metropolitan Transportation System, Metro, serves over 10 million people a year throughout the Los Angeles Basin and over 80,000 passengers a day. With that amount of ridership, it's impossible to police more than a fraction of the trains and cars. Armor models all possible paths through the system in space and time as mathematical operators that represent when and where a passenger boards a train, how many stops they remain on the train, and where and when they exit. Then, they superimpose on this passenger flow model another model of police actions to determine which trains to board or exits to monitor. So the first step here was immersion. This is a critical step in any of our deployments. We go out and immerse ourselves in the environment that the security teams operate in, in this case, patrolling on the trains in Los Angeles. So when we started the project, uh, the CREATE project team came to visit us at the Sheriff's Department. We shared our historical data. We uh, have invited the team to come out on patrols with our deputies. So they've actually ridden the train, watched how our deputies and security assistants actually perform their duties, saw the rigors of that task, saw how we have to patrol the system while allowing people to move freely and quickly. Uh, through the system. In the early work, we've noticed that uh, enforcement personnel using trust routines are getting a better detection rate and actually interdicting uh, fare evaders at a higher rate. We hope to use this understanding to build the algorithms that will support the uh, trust rollout to address serious crime, such as robbery, cell phone theft, assaults against persons, and ultimately to help us deploy our counterterrorism units. Today, Armor is being used for optimal randomization in many ways. At airports for checkpoints, at harbors for boat patrols, for federal air marshal assignments to protect commercial flights, and for transportation security, becoming a signature tool of the corresponding protective agency, with each deployment of armor customized for the security risk at hand. The impact of all the iterations of armor has been noticeable and the testing and development phase continues as the research team and our law enforcement partners make refinements to the system. CREATE is proud to discover another useful application for armor in the pursuit of the security for our nation. Okay, so I'm the Associate Director for Research Transition and Armour was one of our first successful research projects, as you can see here, but it's not just us. And with all due respect to the amount of papers we publish and articles we write and degree degrees we confer, we are a center in the Department of Homeland Security and we are responsible for making sure that we are moving toward a safer and secure nation. So what I would like to do 
is I think I have a couple members of the Government Advisory Committee. If you're a member of our Government Advisory Committee, would you just stand for half a moment? Just a second. A couple people here. Our Government Advisory Committee are if you have to stand up. So, and, and I introduce them because we meet with them about every six to nine months, present the research that we're working on, and more importantly, they help guide our research efforts. The immersion process that was described in the film is because of our partnerships with them. We are taking graduate students, postdoctoral researchers, and planning, putting them in the real environment. Uh, and they're sitting with operators, and they become students, and they're understanding, most importantly, what are the right questions to ask before we engage in the research that might be transitionable. I'm just looking at here a slide. I'm going to have to do this because I can't see. Um, we have been very fortunate now uh, to, over the last three years, when, when Director Hora came on board, uh, I always told him that I would love to have this series of speakers, and I asked, well, who can I bring? He said, bring anybody you want. So it, it's always great to have a director who supports you in that way, and, and he always has. Uh, you're looking at those folks there, probably in the order of appearance here, uh, former Secretary um, Michael Chertoff, Richard Clark, who is Homeland Security Advisor, of course, uh, National Security Advisor to the President, uh, Mark Sageman, David Gartenstein Ross, who's going to be here this week, and if you don't know David's story, who was actually uh, went from Judaism to Islam, was radicalized and, and got out of a group that was actually supporting uh, Al-Qaeda. Maria Reza, who met a number of the individuals who wound up being 9-11 hijackers when they were meeting in Southeast Asia. Brian Jenkins from RAND, and RAND is a partner corporation, or if you will, institution of CREATE. Matt Bettenhausen, the former director of the Office of Homeland Security under Governor Schwarzenegger and Brown. Fran Townsend, who you all know and see quite often on CNN. And Amy Ziegert, probably one of the leading intelligence academics in this country and is now teaching and co-teaching, in fact, at Stanford with her doctoral chair, Condoleezza Rice. So I'm very, very fortunate today to have someone who has always been a lecturer in our executive program since the beginning. In fact, the only two people that have lectured in every single series, now the fifth one, are Boaz Ganor and Peter Bergen. And I, I don't know if Peter remembers, but I, I followed Peter's career. Who wouldn't? I mean, there's only a few Western journalists. I think there's three that I've interviewed, Osama bin Laden. And I met Peter at an invitation-only intelligence conference in Washington many years ago. And we have been close friends ever since. And it's kind of interesting because whenever I'll send him an email or, or, or a text, I'll usually start with my question. And then my second question is, what country are you in? And it, go, it ranges from Afghanistan to Pakistan. It's rarely in Washington, D.C., where he lives. Uh, but he, he really does get around. And he's someone that, if there's a terrorism incident that's happening, he is CNN's guy. There's no doubt about it. He's the author of three previous books. Manhunt is out now. Um, three previous books about Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, two of which were New York Times bestsellers. He's CNN's national security analyst and director of the New America Foundation. He's held teaching posts at Harvard and at Johns Hopkins and is a graduate of Oxford. I'm very, very honored and, and privileged to serve with him on the Bipartisan Policy Center's Homeland Security Project, along with Fran Townsend, Mike Leiter, Bruce Hoffman, and, and a number of others. But it gives me great pleasure to introduce my esteemed friend and colleague, Mr. Peter Bergen. Thank you, Errol, for that very kind in, in introduction. And thank you for the invitation to speak uh, um, here at USC. Um, sorry, I'm casually dressed. United lost my bag on the way here, but um, so basically I would like to talk today about kind of where Al-Qaeda is, where the domestic terrorism threat is, how we've done as a nation against this threat. And, um, you know, I would say I think we've done very well. Um, I mean, if you think about it, uh, if we'd had this conversation back in 2002, or 2003, I mean, we would have been anticipating some, you know, large-scale attack on the homeland, perhaps with weapons of mass destruction of some kind. And of course, that hasn't happened, and there's a whole range of reasons for that. Um, and let me maybe just start there, because I think the enemy is, is weak, and our defenses are strong. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that there won't be an attack, because terrorism as a tactic has been around 
since the dawn of history, um, and we're not going to abolish terrorism, uh, even if we def largely defeat Al Qaeda. Um, there are, you know, all forms, all sorts of forms of political violence have been around, and there may be a form of political violence that we don't know that even don't know the name of that of that form, that will suddenly be a big deal 15 years from now. After all. It wasn't clear to many people until the embassy attacks in Africa in 98 that Al-Qaeda was a problem. And it wasn't the first time that anybody in the US government actually wrote the word Al-Qaeda on an official document it was probably in 1992. So the point is, is that threats can develop um, you know, quite fast and, and from directions that we don't anticipate. But leaving aside the issue of to what extent we did not or, or anticipate or did anticipate Al-Qaeda's threat to the United States. The fact is, is that we have applied an enormous amount of pressure to Al-Qaeda. If you think about 9-11, what was 9-11 what was intended to do? Obviously, it was intended to kill a lot of people, but what was the actual point as far as Osama bin Laden was concerned? Osama bin Laden wanted to apply so much pressure to the United States by an attack that killed a lot of Americans that we would withdraw from the Middle East. And Errol mentioned that I met bin Laden. Uh, I met him in 97. And one of the things that he said during the course of that interview was basically that the United States was a paper tiger, that it was as weak as the former Soviet Union. And he based that assessment on our United States pull out of Vietnam in, 19, in the 1970s, the United States pull out of Beirut in 1983 after the Marine barracks attack, the United States pull out of Somalia after the Black Hawk Down incident in 1993. Well, we don't have vital interests in Somalia or Lebanon or Vietnam. We obviously have very vital interests in Washington and New York. And the idea that somehow because we, we were attacked in Washington and New York, that our reaction would then be to say, okay, we're gonna pull out of the Middle East. It was a ludicrous idea on its face. And instead of pulling out of the Middle East, we're now more engaged in the Middle East than we've ever been in our history. We invaded and occupied Afghanistan and Iraq. We have huge bases in Qatar and Bahrain and Kuwait, um, we're very engaged in the Middle East. Uh, so bin Laden's strategic goal was not achieved. Subsidiarily, Al-Qaeda, which means the base in Arabic, lost the best base it ever had, which was the pre-9-11 Afghanistan, where it was running something of a parallel state uh, to the Taliban, conducting its own foreign policy, training thousands of people every year, completely unmolested by any outside sort of uh, attacks or influence. And they had a basically a complete a, a country at their, dispo, at their disposal. They lost the best base there they ever had. Their strategy backfired. And then we basically took a hammer on them, and they have never recovered. And they're trying to recover in certain places. They're trying to regroup and create a safe haven where they can train people, um, whether for insurgencies around the Muslim world or for terrorist attacks in the West. But that project has not gone particularly well. And what is my evidence for that? Well, let's start with the fact that Al-Qaeda hasn't conducted a successful attack in the United States, obviously, since 9-11. They haven't conducted a successful attack in the West since the 7-7 attacks in London on July 7, 2005. And it's sort of a record of failure. And it is a failure, by the way, that was well understood by Osama bin Laden in his final, in his final years. Because if you look at the documents that have been publicly re released from the Abbottabad compound where bin Laden lived the last five and a half years of his life, he had a pretty good self-assessment of where Al-Qaeda was. He was extremely concerned about the US drone program in Pakistan. Uh, the New America Foundation, where I work in Washington, which is a nonpartisan think tank, we carefully follow the uh, drone strikes based on public information, of which there's quite a lot. And we have found that in, since 2008, 30 leading members of Al-Qaeda in Pakistan have been killed by drones, and 37 leading members of Al-Qaeda have been killed in Yemen by drones just in the last three years. And this is not a game of whack-a-mole where you just, you know, where suddenly else, somebody else pops up. If you take out the, the people in their 30s and the 40s and you eliminate that level of leadership, it's very hard for them to reconstitute. And in the, in the documents in bin Laden's compound that have been released, they talk about the fact that they're, the people with the maturity and the experience are just being taken off the battlefield. Um, and by our, our calculation, there are probably only four leaders of Al-Qaeda in Pakistan left. 
There is Eamon Al-Zawari, who's of course the leader of the group now, a guy called Adam Shukram Jumra, who's actually an American citizen, who is now the sort of leader of external operations. Um, there is a guy called Saif Al-Adil, who is a military commander of the, of the group, but he's kind of keeping a low profile. And finally, there is a guy who's a Pakistani called uh, Khaled Habib. But this is an organization that is running out of leaders. And this is an organization that is not capable, it, it, it is not capable of implementing the strategy that it would like to do, which is attack the West and change uh, the Middle East so that you have Taliban-style regimes you know, across the region. So what is it capable of doing? Well, it's, cap it's defaulted to two basic strategies which aren't really strategies, they're more like tactics. One is to try and encourage lone wolves in the West to attack, and the other one is to try and take advantage of what's going on in the Arab world as a result of the Arab Spring. And how, how is that project going? Well, on, obviously in Boston, we have a very tragic answer to the, to the first part of that question, which is, you know, these groups are going to be able to appeal to young men it's almost invariably young men. We have a, a data set of 212 cases of jihadist extremists who've been either indicted, convicted, or have ended up being killed in the United States since 9-11. Um, interestingly, there's no ethnic profile. 22% are Middle Eastern or North African. 20% roughly are South Asian. 15% uh, roughly are Somali or Ethiopian. 10% uh, are African American. 10% are Caucasian. Uh, around 10% are Hispanic stroke Caribbean. So there's always going to be somebody out there who's going to be a taker for this ideology. Now, most of the time, these guys, there are only six women, interestingly, in this data set. Um, so they're overwhelmingly men. They, mo most of them, you know, d you know, aren't particularly smart, uh, although, you, you know, being a successful terrorist doesn't, you know, you can, obviously you can conduct a terrorist attack even if you're not the world's brightest person, although it helps if you're going to do something really big and it, it, like 9-11, it, it helps if you, you have somebody like Mohammed Atta, the leader of the attack who had a PhD from a German university. But if we look at the, um, the two brothers in, in, Bo in Boston, Joe Carr and Tamerlane, they're certainly not the brightest of, of bulbs, and, but they were able to pull off this attack and unfortunately, they got lucky. And in my view, and I'd be interested in the Q&A to get your own sense of this, I think the United States' reaction to the Boston attack was pretty good. Um, I mean, there may have been, I think, the Boston, for all sorts of reasons that probably are completely reasonable, Boston but closing down the airport, completely closing down the metropolis, that may have been an overreaction. Uh, although, obviously, if you're in the, you know, if you're in the, the responsible situation to making those decisions, you know, it's hard to second guess them. But I think Americans in general understood that Boston was not gonna be a regular feature of American life, but on the other hand, that it was not gonna be, that the standard that, you know, there's gonna be no terrorism ever, that that was an unreal, unreasonable expectation. And that the only way, and so therefore that we showed a somewhat resilient, I think, uh, response to the Boston attack. And unfortunately, the only way you can show that you have resilience is after, is when there is an event. You can't predict, are we gonna be resilient? You can only really sort of observe that after the event. And societies which have a lot of terrorism, like Israel and, and back in the 70s, the United Kingdom, certainly are quite resilient to terrorism. But you don't want, obviously, to have terrorism, a lot of terrorism to find out that you're resilient. But the point is, I think that, I think Americans reacted, I think, in a, in a, they had a sense of proportion about this. So, you know, going forward, a Boston where four people are killed uh, is, is a tragedy, but it's not a catastrophe. 9-11 was both a tragedy and a catastrophe. And if that is what Al-Qaeda-inspired individuals are left able to do in the United States, I think that is, you know, not bad, given where we were in the immediate aftermath about, of 9-11, thinking that you know, uh, that 9-11 was gonna be one of a series of catastrophic attacks. Obviously, Christmas Day 2009 would be a kind of counter-argument to some of the things I've just been saying. So on Christmas Day 2009, as you recall, the Nigerian, recruited by Al-Qaeda in Yemen, uh, got an underwear bomb onto the plane and was, you know, and, and tried to detonate it. Luckily, it didn't work. 
I think if it had worked, we'd be having a different conversation, uh, arguing against some of the same points I've just made, because 300 Americans, mostly Americans, dying uh, in a plane that blows up over a major metropolitan city, covered live by every TV network, and where there's substantial casualties on the ground as well, uh, that would be a very big event. And not only would it be a big event as just an event, it would be a huge political event. If you think about the political costs of the Obama presidency of that near miss, think about the political cost of the Obama presidency if that had happened, if that had actually happened. I think that that would have probably made President Obama a one-term president if that had succeeded. And as you know, there was a lot of discussion internally about missed signals, and generally speaking, in any kind of attack, there were missed signals uh, when you look back and you have the benefit of 2020 hindsight. But the group that did this attack, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is Al-Qaeda's affiliate in Yemen, I think is really in bad shape now. If we'd been talking about them in 2009, we'd have, you know, there was a, the assessment that this was arguably the biggest terrorist threat to the United States, and I, I think that was a reasonable assessment. But as I mentioned, 37 of their leaders or senior operatives have been killed in an incredibly aggressive drone campaign in Yemen. Um, the last time that they, did a, they, wanted, they tried to get together a serious plot against the United States was in October of 2010. You may recall the plan was to send a couple of ca ink, uh, par um, cartridges, uh, which were actually bombs, on cargo planes flying to the United States destined for Chicago. Uh, Saudi intelligence tipped uh, US uh, off, and uh, luckily the bombs were found. But since then, this group has not tried to do a serious attack against American targets. And this group, which at one point in 2011 controlled much of southern Yemen, uh, has also lost militarily, because the Yemeni army, with US, milit with US help, JSOC, CIA, and, and other forms of help, has really pushed Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula out of much of southern Yemen. So how could Al-Qaeda resuscitate, resuscitate itself, given the things I've just described? And I, the one area where they could resuscit, resuscitate themselves is in Syria. You know, the most effective group now fighting um, the Assad regime is Al-Qaeda. And um, they don't call themselves Al-Qaeda because they've, for the first time in Al-Qaeda's history, they've begun learning from their mistakes. This is a group that doesn't learn from its mistakes. The United States made some mistakes after 9-11. We, we have a sort of self-corrective function. Uh, Al-Qaeda has not been able somehow to do that. But they are showing some evidence in Syria, which I think is kind of worrisome. And what do, we, what do I mean by that? Al-Qaeda in Syria is basically Al-Qaeda in Iraq by a different name. It, it, Syria was a kind of key transit point for foreign fighters going into Iraq. Um, these groups are, uh, have had a sort of long sort of uh, relationship. And Al-Qaeda in Iraq basically committed suicide by its tactics in, in Anbar province in western Iraq in 2006. It basically tried to impose Taliban-style rule on the Iraqi tribes. Um, no smoking, no drinking, no, you know, uh, no smoke, uh, you know, they would execute people for very minor infractions which produced the Sunni awakening, which was a tribal revolt, which the United States military then kind of attached itself to and amplified, and basically defeated Al-Qaeda in Iraq in 2007. In the bin Laden documents, there was a, quite a detailed discussion about this issue. Al-Qaeda's leaders well understood how damaging Al-Qaeda in Iraq had been to their brand, and there has been some soul searching. So if you look at what Al-Qaeda in Syria is now doing, it is, for instance, holding ice cream socials. It is, for instance, organizing tug of war competitions. And I, there's a video, uh, there's video of this material that came out just this month. Um, it is holding town meetings to discuss stuff. And if you look at the videotapes that these groups are producing, instead of the usual fare of young men shooting off machine guns and civilian casualties purportedly caused by the United States, it's much more the Mujahideen talking with the young boys and talking with the old men and being kind of a sort of gentler, kindler Al-Qaeda. And I think the fact that they're learning from their mistakes suggests, suggests a potential problem for us, obviously. Because if they are the most effective fighting force against Assad, which is the case, and if they are able to establish a safe haven 
in Syria, which they are doing, and if they are able to attract foreign fighters, including Westerners, we've had Nicole Mansfield, who's an American citizen, 33-year-old uh, from Flint, Michigan, who, who just recently was killed in Syria, uh, who may have been trying, may have been part, joining, joining up with an Al-Qaeda group. We've had another gentleman by the, uh, who's a U.S. Army private who fought with al-Nusra, which is the Al-Qaeda affiliate in Syria. Uh, and also we've had quite a number of Europeans. There are 100 Brits have gone to fight the uh, hundred Australians, each, each country in Europe has sent a contingent. And the war in Syria is likely to go on for a very long time. And we know from the Afghan war that there's nothing better than a war situation where everybody meets and gets training and exchanges business cards to create a kind of global movement. And that is what you can kind of see could happen in Syria. But also they could not. I mean, we had a big concern in this country about, for instance, not exact analog, but has some similarities. We had a big concern about the Somali Americans, many of whom came from Minneapolis, going to Somalia, fighting, um, and then coming back and doing something here. Well, it turns out that a lot of them got killed in Somalia. You know, they didn't, they, they didn't come back because they, they're dead. Um, and of course, there was a big law enforcement effort to work out who these people were. Even if they came back, they would be the subject of a great deal of law enforcement interest. Similarly with Iraq, Iraq was attracting a lot of foreign fighters. Most of them ended up as suicide attackers or, or a large number, and many of them were killed. So it doesn't have to end this way, but it's certainly something we need to consider as we think about can Al-Qaeda revitalize itself, and it seems to me that the one way it could is through the Syrian conflict. The Syrian conflict also is a perfect, it is a perfect conflict for these groups. Assad is an Alawite, which is regarded, so therefore he's a heretic. Most, almost all Muslims would regard Alawism as a, as a heresy. Assad is also a secularist, so therefore he's also an apostate. Assad is inflicting a absolutely appalling war on his mostly Sunni population. Uh, so he is a brutal dictator. Um, Syria is an Arab country. Al-Qaeda is an Arab organization. For them, Afghanistan was basically a sideshow. They get trained up there and then they come back to the Arab world and do what they wanted, which was really to overthrow the Arab regimes. So it's in the heart of the Arab world. It's got a perfect villain. Um, and it is also kind of drawing in a, a sort of regional conflict because the people who are supporting the kind of Sunni militants are, of course, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, which have unlimited resources. And then on the other side, you have Iran and Hezbollah who are propping up the Syrian regime. And you could make an argument that, from our perspective, the fact that the people who are the most effective fighting forces in Iraq right now, in, in Syria right now, are Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah, I mean, from our point of view, maybe that's not a terrible thing. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact that President Obama has sort of been pretty careful about um, getting involved may, you know, is quite prudential on some levels. Um, you know, historians are either going to say that was prudential or this guy sat on his hands while hundreds of thousands of people died. Um, and it's still not clear where we are exactly with that. Um, but the fact is, it's a very complicated situation. So Al-Qaeda could, could resuscitate, resuscitate itself. I'm not convinced because I think that they will default to their normal MO, which is impose Taliban-style rule on the population, and the population will either rise up if they can, or they'll wait around for somebody to liberate them. And the classic recent example of that is what happened in Mali. So Al-Qaeda comes in, they take over half of Mali, which is a country twice the size of France. They basically take over the entire north. Uh, they ban smoking, they ban drinking, they ban singing in, country, in a country that uh, enjoys all, all, all of those things. Uh, the population isn't happy, but they have no way of uh, responding. And then the French come in, and that, bear in mind that Mali was part of the French Empire until relatively recently. The French army is greeted as an army of liberation. Uh, it basically takes out Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, uh, and um, the, you know, the place is you know, returning to normal. Uh, because, and the reason I, I cite that example is because I think encoded in the DNA of these groups are the seeds of their own destruction. They, and they basically, they have four big problems, each one of which is, you know, a big problem, but taken together, I think, means that they're on the wrong side of history. First of all, they're killing a lot of Muslims, and this is well understood in the, in the Muslim world. West Point did an interesting study of Arab language news accounts of uh, terrorist attacks in the Arab world, and these are, the, the, 
the, the study found that overwhelmingly the reporters would talk about the number of civilian casualties. And so Al-Qaeda itself is aware of the problem of civilian casualties. In fact, one of the letters in the, in the bin Laden document trove that was publicly released is a letter from Al-Qaeda's leadership to the leader of the Pakistani Taliban saying, stop attacking mosques, stop attacking markets, you are killing too many civilians. So problem number one, they, they position themselves as the defenders of Muslims and yet most of their victims are Muslims. Problem number two, they don't have any political or economic ideas about the very real problems of the Arab world. I mean, it doesn't matter whether Morsi or somebody else is in charge of Egypt, you know, when you've got sort of 30 or 40% unemployment, I mean, you have to say more than we're just gonna bring Sharia, our version of Sharia to solve the problem. It's obviously not gonna solve it. And what Al-Qaeda and groups like it, like it are just offering Taliban-style regimes, uh, which very few Muslims want to live under that utopia uh, that the Taliban are promising here on Earth. The third problem that these groups have is they've made a world of enemies. So I can't think of a category of institution, person, or, or, or country that Al-Qaeda or groups like it haven't said you know, that they're opposed to. So they're opposed to every Middle Eastern government, any Muslim who doesn't precisely share their views, the Shia, the Jews, every Western government, the Russians, Chinese, the Indians, the United Nations, the international media, the list goes on and on. So if it's not a winning strategy to add to your list of enemies, and which is what they've done. And finally, they won't engage in conventional politics, which brings me back a little bit to Syria, where you know, Al-Qaeda in Syria right now is starting to behave a little bit like Hezbollah, providing social service to the population, not imposing Taliban-style rule. So, you know, that they could perhaps engage, you know, in the future in, in more conventional politics in Syria. But generally speaking, Al-Qaeda doesn't provide anything. I mean, Al-Qaeda hospital is sort of an oxymoron, an Al-Qaeda school. They don't do anything for anybody. They're only really offering violence, which is, you know, at the end of the day is merely a tactic. And so I think when we step back and look at the, the sort of big picture, the big picture is looking pretty bad for Al-Qaeda. Bin Laden himself was keenly aware of this in the, in the documents in the compound. He, He's advising Al-Shabaab, the Somali affiliate of Al-Qaeda, not to use the Al-Qaeda name because it would be bad for, bad for fundraising. It would, be bad, it would attract a lot of negative att attention. And in fact, you've seen some Al-Qaeda groups uh, understand that, hey, the Al-Qaeda brand is actually a really bad thing to have now. So for instance, in Libya, the group that was involved in the attack on the Benghazi consulate is called Ansar al-Sharia, which means support, supporters of Islamic law. It's a very generic name, has nothing to do with al-Qaeda, even though they basically have the same ideas. We also saw Ansar, Ansar al-Sharia as a name in Yemen, which is basically an al-Qaeda front organization. In, in Syria, it's called the al-Nusra fr front, which means the victory front, um, and they don't, they're not calling themselves al-Qaeda. So they have learned that, th that they have problems. I'm not convinced that they'll be able to, to really solve them. And just now talking a little bit about our own strengths and people, everybody in this room has contributed to this effort. If you think about where we were on 9-11, where we are today, it is like night and day. And let me just quickly walk through some obvious points. On 9-11, there were 16 people on the no-fly list. Now there are 20,000 and hundreds of thousands in, in, the, in the TIDE database. Uh, on 9-11, the CIA and the FBI barely talked to each other. Uh, that it was a very different situation. On 9-11, the FBI didn't have 2,000 intelligence analysts. On 9-11, there, no, there was 32 JT, uh, Joint Terrorism Task Force. Now there are 103. On 9-11, there was no DHS. On 9-11, there was no TSA. On 9-11, there was no National Counterterrorism Center. On 9-11, there was no Northern Command. On 9-11, there was no Cyber Command. On 9-11, there was no public knowledge that this was a problem. So the people who disabled the, sh uh, who, who, who took down the, sh the shoe bomber, Richard Reed, were the passengers on the plane because they knew that somebody was smoking shoes on a plane was like a bad thing in the post 9-11 era. Uh, on Christmas Day 2009, it was the passengers who disabled Abel to, sorry, his name is difficult to pronounce. The underwear bomber, we'll call him. Uh, it was the passengers who disabled him. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a street vendor in Times Square on May 1st, 2010, who noticed that an SUV was smoking, which turned out to be Faisal Shahzad, recruited by the Pakistani Taliban, um, trying to blow up an SUV in Times Square on a Saturday night. Public knowledge is a huge kind of force multiplier for all this. And, and we can go, you know, on 9-11, the intelligence budget was 25 billion, now it's 80 billion. And there's a whole range of things that has made the United States a much harder target. So if you take together Al-Qaeda's own sort of weaknesses, and then you throw in our own strengths, I mean, I think we're in a pretty good situation. And of course, that is not, if you work in the government, you work in law enforcement, you, 
Um, you, know, you can't take your eye off the ball, you can't become complacent, and, by the way, something we haven't even discussed is right-wing extremists in this country have killed more people than jihadi extremists since 9-11 for political purposes. If you look at the number of people killed in jihadi terrorism attacks since 9-11, it's 21. 13 of them at Fort Hood, two at LAX, if you take the El Al attack, uh, one in a, a Jewish community center in Seattle, uh, you know, four in Boston, one at the Little Rock, Arkansas recruiting center uh, in 2009 where a U.S. Army soldier was killed. And, and so 21, you know, is, again, that would not have been predictable immediately after 9-11. Now, by contrast, right-wing extremists who kill lots of people, lots of hundreds of people every year, mostly for purely criminal reasons. If you look, and as we've done at the foundation I work at, if you look at right-wing extremists who've killed for pol clearly political reasons, attacking an abortion clinic doctor, attacking an IRS official, uh, attacking police officers, you, we come up with 29 deaths. And that's certainly an underestimation for the following reason. First of all, these stories tend to be local stories. They don't get a lot of national attention. They're not treated as terrorism crimes, both as a statutory matter or by the press. Um, and so they don't get as much attention. And so, but they, they certainly exist. And one interesting data point from our study is the 212 jihadi extremists that I mentioned not one of them is engaged in a chemical, biological, or radiological, or certainly nuclear, kind of uh, a, a, in any kind of shape or form, trying to buy, acquire, make. By contrast, 13 right-wing extremists have been involved in either acquiring, making, plotting in a serious manner to make uh, chemical, biological, crude weapons. One left-wing extremist and two people two other extremists with idiosyncratic motives that you could, like Bruce Ivins, who clearly was a strange guy. Um, so there you have it. If there is an attack with a you know, crude chemical, biological, uh, radiological weapon, it is not going to come necessarily from Al-Qaeda. It come, could come from another political dimension. And terrorism will be around. Um, but I think that we have reason to be somewhat optimistic about uh, Al-Qaeda as a as, a, as you know, basically President uh, George W. Bush, nine days after 9-11, when he spoke to the joint uh, session of the Houses of Congress, said essentially that Al-Qaeda would eventually join the, un the unmarked grave of discarded lies, just like fascism and communism had before them. Uh, and President Obama has called them small men on the wrong side of history. And I think that's both really, really true. And one final thing, just to kind of maybe put a sort of punctuation mark on this. I think the death of bin Laden was an important event, uh, restoration of American national honor uh, for the victims of 9-11. But also, you know, it, it's an opportunity, I think, for us to say, are we in a different phase? And I think the president, in his speech that he gave at National Defense University on May 23rd, uh, started that conversation. I think it's a very important one. The reason the, the authorization for the use of military force, which is what Congress voted a few days after 9-11, is the reason that we are able to conduct operations in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, other countries. And, and the, the, the authorization for the use of military force, all the various congressmen and congresswomen who voted for that, I don't think they expected that the war would go on you know, for 12 years, uh, that uh, the war would be conducted in countries other than Afghanistan, and I think when President Obama spoke at National Defense University, he basically said that we should be thinking about kind of entering a post-war world, which doesn't mean that you can't take drone strikes at people who are imminent threats. Uh, the commander-in-chief uh, in the Article Two authorities as a commander-in-chief, an imminent threat to the United States can be responded to. Think about Bill Clinton taking out, taking cruise missile attacks on Osama bin Laden before 9-11. You don't need to be in a permanent state of war. And we've never in our history uh, said, we're just gonna be at war forever. Uh, I think it's fundamentally a sort of un-American concept. Um, and I don't think, but there will be a political battle ahead. I think uh, there will be people in Congress who say, hey, we should kind of extend this authorization for the use of military force. We should name new groups with whom we're at war at. I think that would be uh, dangerous. Uh, you, we don't need to protect ourselves by being in a state of permanent war. Thank you.
everything he's written, but I do want him to at least talk about two things. One, um, his adventure, if you will, in interviewing bin Laden and, and how that went. And then two, uh, we happened to be in Washington together when we were going to look at uh, Zero Dark Thirty before it was released to the public, and Peter had already seen it, so I'd like to get his take on the accuracy and some of the things that were in Zero Dark Thirty. So first, your adventures with Mr. Bin Laden. I don't remember any, anything about it. <laughs> uh, um, I, meeting Bin Laden in 97 was complicated. Um, I was living in New York in the early 90s, and so when the Trade Center was attacked on February 28th, um, 93, uh, this seemed to me like a very big story. And I went to my bosses in Afghan and at CNN and said, I, we should go to Afghanistan because everybody involved in this attack seems to have either spent time in Afghanistan or is in some way associated with the Afghan war effort. And so we went there and we did a, an hour and a half program basically saying that Afghanistan in the early 90s seemed to be a lot like Lebanon in the mid 80s, which is a place where terrorism was being fermented and drug, drug trafficking. And then in 96, for the first time, I heard Osama bin Laden's name. The white State Department produced a very useful white paper about him. And it struck me that whoever did the Trade Center was part of an organization, and organizations have leaders, and maybe bin Laden was the leader of this organization. And that, you know, bin Laden was an unindicted co-conspirator in the 93 attack, and in fact, he had really nothing to do with it, except that Ramzi Youssef, the mastermind, was both Hala Sheikh Mohammed uh, but his nephew, but also um, Ramsey Yusuf had trained in an Al Qaeda training camp. So that's how I got into it. Was uh, you know was my interest in the first Trade Center attack, and I went to my bosses and said, you know, can we go and meet Bin Laden? They didn't know who Bin Laden was obviously at the time because he really hadn't done anything as far as we knew. He'd been identified as the financier of Islamic extremism movements, and that's how the U.S. government kind of thought about him, and. So, you know, meeting him was a huge process, and um, which I won't de bore you with now, but it took many, many months. Uh, there were some people who worked for bin Laden in a sort of more, uh, sort of overground way, who lived in London, and I spent a lot of time with them. Um, and then we traveled to Afghanistan, through Pakistan, with two of bin Laden's associates, and uh, we checked into a hotel in eastern Afghanistan, a sort of zero-star hotel, in uh, Jalalabad and waited for bin Laden's sort of team and they, people came and they were checking us out. I think there was a lot of like, where we were being followed and the final, uh, some media advisor came and said you can't bring any of your gear. We had $50,000 of professional gear. They didn't want to bring any of that. They said, leave that behind, you know, we'll supply a camera. They were very careful. Don't forget they killed Akhmar Shah Massoud with a bomb inside a camera four, four years later. So they were very paranoid. They, they at a certain night, they, um, a heavily armed group of men in a van came and picked us up at the hotel. They drove us through the night, change of vehicles, blindfolds, lots of rings of security. People had RPGs and Russian submachine guns. Uh, they searched us carefully again. They swept us for any kind of electronic tracking device. And uh, then we came up to a hut in the middle of the night and we waited, and I calculated it was about midnight when bin Laden arrived. And then, you know, everybody in this room knows infinitely more than we did at the time. I wasn't completely sure what he was going to look like. He was very tall, six foot four. He spoke uh, like a cleric. You know, he didn't. I thought he might be a table thumping revolutionary. He was very low key, and uh, you know, he delivered this. He didn't talk about American. Um, he didn't talk about Hollywood or our freedoms or the Supreme Court or the First Amendment or anything like that. He just basically, it was a fairly smart critique of American foreign policy in the, in, the, in, the, in the Middle East in particular. U.S. support for Saudi Arabia, he's against it. U.S. support for Israel, he was against it. U.S. support for the, you know, Mubarak, he was against it, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of it, I was like, well, that's all very interesting. He basically declared war on the United States. How do you do that from a mud hut in the middle of the night in Afghanistan? And a year later, he supplied the answer, which was the attacks in, in, in Africa, which we, I think we lost a big propaganda advantage at the time. Many of the victims of those attacks were African Muslims. Kenya and Tanzania have very substantial Muslim populations. 12 Americans died, at least 200 Africans died. Um, they killed 
entirely civilians. We should have really, you know, this is their big Achilles heel, as I've sort of laid out already, and we could have used that moment. But from that moment forward, it was clear that he was serious. And uh, Zero Dark Thirty. Yeah, Zero Dark Thirty is, I, you know, a pretty good movie and a pretty on a not good history. Yeah, is how I kind of characterize it in a nutshell. For a start, in a movie, you have to make a lot of creative choices about what you're going to do. Now, the idea that there was one woman in the U.S. government who really wanted to get Bin Laden fails a number of common sense tests uh, immediately. Uh, you know, there were plenty of people who were very keen and were very sure that Bin Laden was, you know, it's the subject of my most recent book. I interviewed almost everybody at the CIA, at the White House, at the Defense Department, um, who was involved in the decision making about that. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of people. There was a, the people who had lived through the Iraq weapons of mass destruction fiasco were more skeptical of a circumstantial case that would involve a significant decision and also a significant action by the United States. So Mike Morrell, who's the deputy director of the CIA, was at 60% when he talked to President Obama about is bin Laden in Abdubad or not, the circumstantial case. There were others who were at 80%. This woman in the film was at 100%. Uh, there was a, 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 an analyst who goes by the pseudonym of John who was also at 100%. 100%. The people who were at 100% were the people who had been following bin Laden for years. The people who were at lower percentages, and President Obama asked Mike Morrell, why are we getting these different percentages? And Morrell says, sir, it's because if you've been on the bin Laden account, you're pretty convinced. If you lived through the weapons of mass destruction fiasco, as I did, you are leery. And I think this is a, actually a very, imp I think this will be one of the key moments of presidential decision making up there with President Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Obviously, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the stakes could not have been higher, basically a nuclear war. Your stakes were lower with bin Laden, but it's the same kind of decision. We are operating with very imperfect information, but you have to make a decision. And at the end of the day, it's only you taking the decision. Because the people who say, well, bin Laden's 40% there or 60% there, that's easy to say. But when you make the decision, he's either 100% there or 100% not there. Um, and you know, that was the decision he faced. And it's also easy in retrospect to say, well, that was an easy decision because we know how it turned out. <laughs> but but they, the one thing they didn't really plan for the White House, it was almost catastrophic success. I mean, you remember the kind of mixed, you know, John Brennan gave this briefing that was full of misinformation, which is, you know, by the way, it was a firefight in the middle of the night of six 6,000 miles away, and you're not going to have perfect information 24 hours later. But, you know, they, they didn't, they plan for every eventuality, many of them very bad. Seals captured or killed, civilians killed, bin Laden not there, you know, massive rupture with the Pakistanis, um, and, you know, things still, still did, uh, did not go right. I would say on Zero Dark Thirty, the most realistic thing is the scene at the compound with the seals. And I was the only outside observer to be allowed into the compound before the Pakistani military demolished it. I didn't know they were going to do that, obviously. I, I, uh, um, when, when they let me to go in, um, but I, I saw the inside of the house, uh, and all that is recreated very well. And the and the and you know the seals were on target for about 38 minutes, and it's probably 38 minutes in the movie. I mean, it's almost a real time recreation. So that that is good. But then you know the the deeper problem, and Mark Bowl, the screenwriter, asked me to see a cut of it in October before it aired. Uh, there were some factual problems which he could, he could take care of, but he couldn't take care of the main point that these coercive interrogations led to bin Laden, which I think is an extremely, um, I, I, I'm pretty sure that's mostly wrong, and I, can't have, I don't have time to explain why, because it's a, the, the finding bin Laden was an Agatha Christie story that took a very long time. There was no particular detainee. There was no, it was sort of almost like when the CIA began to really realize in 2003, we had nothing, bupkis, you know, absolutely nothing on bin Laden. They had to go back to basics and they had to think, okay, we are never gonna get a magic detainee. We're never gonna have, there's nobody, no one's gonna tell us anything about where he is and probably no one knows. And so we need to like really think about how do we find him and basically it came down to a memo that a female analyst who's not in the movie wrote, um, who I give the pseudonym of Rachel to. And um, she wrote a memo in 2005 saying there are four pillars on which we need to kind of 
go back and look at all the intelligence we've collected and collect all the intelligence in the future uh, through, this, through these lenses, which are basically his family, communication with other leaders, communication with the media, including Al Jazeera, because he had released 30 videotapes and audio tapes, and the courier network, because he's clearly communicating, and if we can find the courier, we can find bin Laden, which is, of course, what happened. So we have a mic here that will travel, or we're gonna put it in the center, okay. And we'll take uh, questions from anyone. So, uh, okay, there we go. And if you'll just uh, identify yourself and ask your question. Hi, my name is James Barnes. I work for Boeing. Uh, a general question, I was wondering if you could quickly summarize the state of affairs between Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims. It's bad. And <laughs> what do you see as some of the potential outcomes of that? I mean, that's a, I think it's a very good question in the terms of, like, what are the wild cards that the picture I painted of Al-Qaeda's decline, I've already explained why the Syrian civil war is a big wild card. Related to that is the larger Sunni Shia sort of problem, which exists in a very real way in Iraq right now, obviously. It exists, it is a sectarian civil war in Syria. It is popping up in Lebanon now again, where you have, you've had Al-Qaeda elements. There's been long in Pakistan and also in Afghanistan, a lot of anti-Shia violence. There was just a raid on a prison last night in Pakistan where they released the prisoners but killed the Shia prisoners, the, the Taliban raid. Uh, 200 people released. So, you know, I think that, that is, that's one of the wild cards. Another wild card is, you know, what are we gonna do in Afghanistan after 2014? I think the administration has made an enormous error by talking about a zero option in Afghanistan. For a start, it's a bad idea on its face, and if you're gonna do it, just do it. Don't talk about it for two years before it happens. And, I, you know, no, I don't think any responsible American president is gonna let that happen, because for all sorts of reasons that are too obvious to really outline. Um, we were attacked from Afghanistan. You know, we have lost a lot of blood and treasure uh, in Afghanistan. The political costs of another attack that's traceable to the Afghan-Pakistan region, when we've taken all our troops out, I think would be enormously high, whether it's President Jeb Bush or President Hillary Clinton, doesn't matter. And I, I think, by the way, we've negotiated an agreement with the, with the Afghans, an enormous, it took a long time, the, a strategic partnership agreement that will be there till 2024. So I don't understand why there's this discussion of the zero option. I understand there's frustration with Karzai, he's a frustrating guy, but you don't make important strategic decisions based on peak and, uh, and just because you don't like somebody. Um, so I think the Sunni Shia thing, the Syria civil war, you know, what exactly happens in the post-2040 Afghanistan, these are all kind of wild cards. I, 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 you know, in the unlikely event and the very unfortunate event that we go to zero, I mean, Al-Qaeda, you know, they don't have to be a tactical geniuses, they'd move into Afghanistan. I mean, they, they, they're in the tribal regions of Pakistan because that's the last place left for them, but they certainly uh, would move back into Afghanistan. We've seen some of this already in Kunar and Nuristan where we pulled out. Uh, there are small numbers of Al-Qaeda who have come back. Yes, in the back. Hi, my name is Wendy. Um, so you were saying that they, there's these um, Al-Qaeda groups that aren't going by the same brand anymore, going into places like Syria. Do you think that this will put more pressure on the U.S. to intervene so these groups don't lay groundwork um, in Syria? So let's say the war ends and then they just have this giant country to you know, breed more terrorists and uh, create more problems. You know, Americans do not want another war in the Middle East. You know, Bob Gates, just before he retired, said you need your head examined if you're going to have another major land war, you know, somewhere in the Middle East. And, you know, the, mid the military doesn't want to do it, the president doesn't want to do it, the American public doesn't want to do it. So those are three pretty large kind of votes in this. There, there's going to be no large-scale U.S. intervention in Syria um, and by the way, if there was, you know, it might backfire in the sense that what's the goal, to overthrow Assad or to prevent the rise of Al-Qaeda in Syria? Right now, Al-Qaeda is very effectively fighting Assad, yet we also want Assad to go. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of not what, 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 what are our actual goals in Syria, uh, if, particularly one that involved a military intervention. So I, I don't think it's going to happen. 
we are obviously providing some training. We're obviously providing some, you know, light weapons and trying to encourage the Saudis and the Qataris not to give, you know, Stinger missiles or similar weapons to the rebels, which will, you know, in, could fall into the wrong hands. I mean, there's, it's it's not an easy, you know, it, it's just it's not an easy situation to to know what to do. Uh, but I think that the president is not going to intervene. He hasn't heard a, a military plan that makes sense. Uh, yes. Hi, uh, Ray with the Walt Disney Company. Talking about the foreign fighters specifically, do you think they represent a long-term security threat given that sooner or later they'll return home to either Western Europe or whatever country and they'll already have, or they'll already have developed military skills but also speak the foreign language and have the ability to blend in and have the ability to sort of combine those skills? Yeah, it really depends how many of them kind of exit. You know, I mean, Nicole Mansfield from Flint, Michigan, went over there, got killed. You know, it's not, this is a really very violent war. So a lot of these people aren't, you know, don't have military training and they're going because they believe in the cause. Um, you know, if it's a one-way ticket, you know, it's not going to be a problem, obviously. If it's a two-way ticket, then it could be a problem. Uh, but, you know, merely because you fight, volunteer to fight in a foreign war doesn't necessarily mean that you want to do something bad at home. Um, so, you know, it remains to be seen. But unlike during the, during the Afghan war, we had no idea this was going to be a problem. You know, Al-Qaeda basically had a branch office in Brooklyn. Um, and in other places, parts of the country, it wasn't called Al-Qaeda, it was called the Services Office, which was sort of a pre-Al-Qaeda organization. But we just didn't understand that this foreign, and we encouraged Ali Mohammed, who was Al-Qaeda's military commander, uh, the tr main trainer, was a U.S. Army sergeant who's, you know, was at the Special Warfare Center in, 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 in Georgia, training special operations forces. Um, you know, we didn't, we knew he was going to Afghanistan. His f overall officers didn't really sort of say, you know, they thought it was a problem, the Neutrality Act, etc. but they didn't do anything about it. So now we understand that these foreign jihads can be a problem and we're much more cognizant of it. And, you know, in Iraq, it turned out to be not to be a problem, not only because, as I mentioned, a lot of these guys died when they, when they went there, either as suicide bombers or because they were killed, but also when we recovered the Sinjar documents in Iraq in 2007, which were the documents that laid out where all these foreign fighters were coming from, often down to their home village. We were able to uh, use those documents to go to countries like Libya and other countries which were producing a lot of these foreign fighters and say, you really have a problem that you need to put, get a handle on and appeal to their own self-interest. And um, they, you know, they started clamping down on the foreign fighter flow. The difference is now that the regimes that are in place in many Arab countries are not uh, you know, they may have a more Islamist, they may be more in favor of this. I mean, certainly, and so that, that might be a problem. And also we have less cooperation with their intelligence services than we used to. Um, so, you know, I think that, that's, that it, it is a wild card. And one other big wild card I forgot to mention is, if you're a member of the Muslim Brotherhood and you see what's going on in Egypt, why wouldn't you turn to violence now? You were elected. Um, and it has been, you know, you've been overthrown in a military coup. And all the, so the idea that you can get an Islamist movement coming to office through the election process has been undercut in the most important, most populous Arab country. And I think that's another big wild card. You know, if, if the Muslim Brotherhood is a movement of tens of millions of people, most of whom are not engaged in violence, or a vast majority not engaged in violence, but if they feel like there is no hope of being able to use the democratic process, they will begin to believe the Al-Qaeda idea. Al-Qaeda has been very critical of the Muslim Brotherhood for engaging in elections. Um, but they may come around to Al-Qaeda's point of view that the only way to get change, the change they want, is through violence. Yes. Hi, my name is Daniel. I'm also with the Walt Disney Company. We're kind of doubling up here a little bit. But you have a very dangerous job. How do you stay safe while you're doing it? Uh, I go with my wife. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, no, sometimes I met my wife in Afghanistan, so um, she's from Louisiana, which she, she says Afghanistan and Louisiana are somewhat similar, she says. <laughs> Very tribal. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a war correspondent. I have friends who've been killed in Libya and other places. And, you know, if you're a war photographer, you, you have to be at the action. Uh, Tim Hetherington was a good friend of mine, was killed in Misrata. You know, 
he was doing his job and there's no way around, I mean, doing that kind of job is incredibly dangerous. The job that I do is not at all dangerous, I mean, by comparison. And Afghanistan is not a particularly dangerous country, uh, I was saying at lunch. You know, New Orleans, the murder rate in New Orleans is six times the civilian casualty rate in Afghanistan because of the war. And that is, you know, a very poor reflection on, you know, the reality of what it's like to live in New Orleans. Uh, with a, you know, uh, but Afghanistan is not that dangerous. Uh, Iraq was very dangerous. I mean, for some of the people who served here, uh, you, were 20, you were 20 times more likely to be killed in Iraq as a civilian in 2005 than you are to be killed as a civilian in Afghanistan today. A Afghanistan and Iraq have very similar populations. By the way, you are much more likely to be killed still in Iraq today. La Iraq in 2012, 4,500 civilians killed. Same population as Afghanistan, roughly 30 million. Last year in Afghanistan, 3,000 civilians killed. So, you know, there are certain countries which, and I've only been to Iraq once, that was an extraordinarily dangerous war. You could not go to a restaurant. I mean, in Af you know, in Afghanistan today, you can basically have a reasonably nice life. I mean, I'm not pretending it's perfect, but you can go to a restaurant, you can socialize, you don't have to worry that somebody's gonna kill you at any given moment. And that was not true in Iraq. So, you know, the, the answer to your question is, I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan and Pakistan which are not, they're certainly not, you know, Switzerland, but they are okay in terms of, you know, the risks you're taking. Washington, D.C., where I live, the murder rate is twice what the civilian death rate is in uh, Afghanistan because of the war. And obviously, that's a very, much of the violence is very localized and it's got better, but still, we live in, very, a lot of these cities that we live in are quite dangerous. Before we take the next one, we have a report, Peter and I are, on the Bipartisan Policy Center Homeland Security Project. And uh, we have a report coming out, and I want to give kudos here to Peter and his research team. It's just a yeoman's job in terms of the amount of research. I think you're going to like it. It's on the jihadist terrorism. It's on the emerging threat. Uh, it's about 100 pages. And a conversation that we had last week with Bruce Hoffman and Mike Hurley was the war in Iraq is over. We have a timetable to leave Afghanistan, and yet, as recent as the attack in Boston, the plot here in Los Angeles, and almost a constant theme amongst homegrown terrorists is this visceral response to us being there and this need for retribution for the war in Af Iraq and Afghanistan, which still resonates. Why do you think that is, and do you think that'll ever go away? You know, one of the findings of our uh, database, and it's not a surprising one, is a quarter of the targets uh, of the dom domestic jihadist extremists, so US military targets. I mean, some of them are well known, Major Nadal Hassan at Fort Hood, um, Carlos Bledsoe in Little Rock, Arkansas, killed an American soldier, Fort Dix, uh, the plot to attack, uh, you know, the US military base in Fort Dix. And I mean, there were, so what, um, the, I mean, I think to answer your question is like, you know, Bin Laden's narrative has resonance, luckily for a very small group of people, but what is he really saying? He's saying, there is a war against Islam uh, led by the United States and we have to take revenge. I mean, that's to boil down his message. And that's basically what Joe Carr wrote in the boat in Boston, right? I mean, we're under attack, Muslims, I have to do something about it. And it's a very simple message. Now, you know, your real response to be, if you, even if you accept the idea that the United States is leading a war against Islam, which is, I don't accept at all, but, you know, one response to that would be, hey, I'm gonna go and be a, you know, I'm gonna go and, work as a Peace Corps volunteer in Sudan. <laughs> you know, it doesn't need to be, I'm gonna blow up something at home. I mean, the whole, but so I think that, you know, this, this message is just gonna resonate for a while. And the reason that it's gonna to continue to resonate for a while, it's bound up with a religious ideology. And I think religious ideologies are harder to kill than political ide ideologies. I mean, there are Marxist Leninists somewhere in the United States on some campus in Vermont, but no one pays any attention to them. You know, it is dead as an idea. It only was around for a relatively short time, maybe less than 100 years. You know, violent jihadism, one form or another, has been around for a lot longer. I don't think it's gonna go away. Um, and, uh, but that said, you know, it's, it's a, luckily it's a pretty minority opinion. One thing that's striking to me, if I was living in Europe as a Muslim, I would be, why is it there's been so relatively small number of terrorist attacks in Europe? When you have, you know, 70% of the prison population in France is Muslim, and 10% of the population is, is Muslim. So do the math. I mean, 
these people are, you know, in America, most Muslim, American Muslims are better educated, better, you know, have higher incomes than most Americans, and, and they, they're living the American dream. Um, that is not true for European Muslims, but even there, we're not seeing that much terrorism. So maybe that's just a tribute to law enforcement and, and other measures. Um, but, you know, it just, it, it, it will not disappear. I mean, Mike Sheehan, who was a, you know, you know the, just retired as head of special operations, was asked in a congressional hearing, you know, how long is this going to take? And he said 10 or 20 years. I mean, I think that's a reasonable, it's never going to go away. By the way, one thing that I find very objectionable is the idea that because there are still violent jihadists out there somewhere in the world, we need to maintain a permanent state of war. That has never been the case in any conflict we've ever fought in. Fought in. We didn't say our standard of winning World War II was to capture or kill every Nazi. You know, I think it's an unrealistic standard. The costs of that standard of trying to implement, you know, a total war against anybody who's ever had this kind of idea would be enormous. And Americans don't want to do that, I don't think. But I think there is a constituency that would like to keep that war alive. And we'll take more. Uh, Ron? Now, our last question. Uh, Mr. Bergen, you may have answered part of my question already, but uh, the explanatory memorandum that was seized by the FBI in 2004 outlined the Muslim Brotherhood's game plan for a silent jihad. And, and that was introduced into evidence in 2008 in, in Dallas uh, on the Holy Land Foundation trial. How effective do you think that the Muslim Brotherhood's game plan, as outlined in the explanatory memorandum for a silent jihad, is being waged in this country? And is the administration aware and doing anything about what is the game plan for the silent jihad? I mean, my view is I, I, I'm very skeptical about the idea that they're waging kind of some sort of silent jihad in this country. I mean, it's not going very well. If, if, if um, it's so silent, it it's, um, just doesn't exist. Um, so I, I'm not convinced that uh, there's some kind of, you know, greens under the bed, some sort of Muslim brotherhood, fifth column. I mean, I just, I don't, it, I just, I just don't see it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have something for you over here. So after all these years of supporting us as a lecturer. Uh, I'd like to, on behalf of CREATE and the University of Southern California, give you a small token of our appreciation and thank you again for coming today. Thank you, that's great. Okay. Wow. Thank you. Okay. So, Peter will be around for a few moments. If, uh, if you have, if you've brought one of his uh, books with you to be signed, He'll make himself available. Thank you again for coming. Do save the date for October 1st. Our next distinguished speaker is going to be Congresswoman Harmon, and you'll receive invitations, and thank you for your support. Good afternoon. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.